So, ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, uh, welcome you uh, to the United States Institute of Peace. My name is Bill Taylor. Uh, I'm the acting president for the next couple of days. Uh, we'll have a new president uh, of uh, the Institute of Peace who will join us. A woman, Madam President, you'll be happy to know, uh, will we'll, uh, take over the Institute on Monday. Um, it's a great pleasure um, for the United States Institute of Peace to welcome back uh, Minister Wallstrom to, uh, to this forum. Um, she has been here before, uh, has given speeches here before, and we're very pleased to welcome her back as, in her new capacity as the Foreign Minister of Sweden. Um, she was appointed to serve as the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden October 14th, so just this last October. Among other positions, she previously served as the Vice President of the European Commission, of, uh, as a member of the Swedish Parliament, and first ever Special Representative of the UN Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict. So this is a perfect opportunity for us to welcome you here, uh, Madam Foreign Minister. USIP is hosting this, co-hosting with the, with the Embassy of Sweden, uh, and we have the Ambassador here, thank you, sir. Um, others of the, of the Embassy are joining us here. We both are committed to this topic of, uh, of gender and violence and the role of women in foreign policy. Um, this is our sixth year of, uh, of, a, of a gender program under Kathleen Kunas. We're very pleased that, uh, that, that she has put this uh, program together along with the Embassy of Sweden. Um, the Swedish government has pledged to increase its focus on women's issues with what it, it describes as a feminist foreign policy. And we are all looking forward to hearing how that, uh, how that plays out. Um, in her career, she has focused on these issues. She will undoubtedly tell you the, the kinds of work that she has done uh, to firmly integrate gender lens in all aspects of Swedish foreign policy. We're very eager to hear Minister Wallström elaborate on her vision for how her nation's foreign policy can be further strengthened with attention to gender perspectives. Um, we will be followed, and the uh, minister's uh, remarks will be followed by a remarkable panel, all ambassadors on this panel. We're very uh, uh, amazed that, uh, to have this level um, and very pleased. And our first, uh, before, we, before we do that, Minister Wallstrom, we're glad to have you to USIP. Thank you very much for coming. Excellencies, dear friends, my colleagues, uh, uh, when looking at, at all of you and in preparing for this and understanding who would be here to on the stage with me, uh, actually the thanking part of my speech uh, became a whole one and a half page. And I, I think maybe that will take too long from from my speech, so I'll just say thank you so much to all of you, and I'm particularly pleased to see so many of, of my friends, and we have uh, even met at, uh, as, as you said, Ambassador Dusty, uh, on a dusty road or a, in an airport in a place that nobody knows exactly where it is, um, uh, and also seeing friends here at the, uh, the um, Institute for Peace. Um, I am very honoured to explain to you that the new Swedish government is going to pursue a feminist foreign policy and to say something about that. And my first statement when, when I was appointed uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, was uh, received with some enthusiasm uh, but also a fair share of scepticism, uh, to put it kindly like the suffragettes uh, uh, at the turn of the 20th century uh, fighting for their political rights in the UK and, and the USA were met with uh, <clears throat> considerable derision. Uh, even the term suffragettes uh, was initially intended as a mockery. Um, the notion of a feminist foreign policy has also given rise to irony among some observers. We call it the, the giggling factor. However, uh, looking back, history uh, proved women right and our democratic institutions are stronger for it. So as we move forward, I take uh, great strength in Gandhi's words. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. <laughs> so uh, a 
Feminist foreign policy essentially seeks to address what uh, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has so aptly described as the great unfinished business of the 21st century. Many countries, including my own, are still char characterized by the systematic subordination of women. In many parts of the world, the fact that women and girls continue to be denied their human rights constitutes a growing threat to peace and security. Striving towards gender equality is therefore not only a goal in itself, but also a precondition for achieving our wider foreign development and security policy objectives. I would like to focus here today on the how and the what of our uh, feminist foreign policy. What are our priority areas and what are the tools at our disposal to advance the feminist foreign policy agenda? There are three indispensable and interdependent concepts that are crucial to the how of moving the feminist foreign policy agenda forward. The three R's of the feminist toolbox, rights, representation, and resources. And some would say maybe it starts with a, a fourth R that is actually um, reality check. Um, but first, uh, let me talk about respect for human rights and the rule of law, uh, constituting essential starting points for every discussion about gender equality. Ensuring women's rights uh, and access to justice must be seen as um, uh, central to achieving the overall human rights agenda. This is far from today's reality. Women's rights are often seen as a specific and separate issue. We will need to work multilaterally and bilaterally, creating global conditions in order to ensure that gender perspectives are included in strategic discussions, decisions, and most importantly, concretized at country level. And of course, today we discuss, for example, and let's do that, let's discuss, for example, the situation in Ukraine. Second, increasing women's representation. So if rights is the first R, Second is uh, R as in representation. We need to uh, increase women's representation in governance and peace building efforts, in economies and core institutions. And this is a sine qua non in achieving gender equality. Only through women active participation at different levels of decision making can we transform agendas so that the needs and interests of women are truly reflected and addressed. Reality on the ground give uh, considerable scope for improvement. Out of 585 negotiated peace agreements from 1990 to 2010, only 92 contained references to women. From 92 to 2011, fewer than 4% of signatories of peace agreements and less than 10% of peace negotiators were women. We will actively um, advocate women's inclusion in all peace building processes, but also initiate measures in order to create a network of women mediators that can be called upon. And I do not want anyone to ever say again that there are no competent women around to involve. We will continue to support women's organizations in conflict and post-conflict settings in cooperation with civil society and through the UN. And the third R is as in resources. Um, resources to receive these ends must be increased and channeled in such a way that to ensure that essential uh, goals have financial backing. As an example, today, only 1% of spending in security sector reform is allocated to initiatives which consider gender equality a significant objective. Furthermore, in a sample of six post-conflict countries, less than 8% um, of spending was specifically budgeted to empower women or promote gender equality. Increasing and redirecting resources uh, <clears throat> towards gender-specific targets will require um, considerable political commitment and specific budgeting. But more importantly, budgetary methods that direct flows 
uh, of money to support gender targets. We will develop and bring such methods to bear at home and in foreign policy settings. Achieving gender equality will require new and coherent approaches upstream and downstream, including everything from agenda setting, information and data gathering, analysis and decision making, and intervention designed to follow up and accountability. Accountability will be key. We will give priority to the following five inter interdependent pillars, which we see as essential in achieving gender equality targets and improving the lives of, of women and girls. Uh, and I will be short, don't worry. Uh, first, rule of law and human rights, because these are crucial elements and constitute both the means and the end delivering on binding commitments and developing central aspects of international law in a gender-sensitive manner are of paramount importance. Despite the difficulties experienced in many contexts, we must aspire to, to move beyond merely defending current achievements, not least to counteract the notion that women's rights can be denied by reference to traditional norms and religious beliefs. And I recently visited a country where um, I was told that 50% of the, the girls are married uh, before the age of 18. And I said, so, so you have such a high rate of child marriage. And they said, we call it early marriage. And that is one of the, if you, you know, the, the word leads the, the thought. And of course, you first have to define um, the, the challenge and, and the problem, and you have to give it a name to be able to, to act. Uh, secondly, combating gender-based and sexual violence in, in peacetime and in conflict remains, of course, a, a, a core priority, because this is a global epidemic, and of, I, could, I could talk forever about that. I've d done that before here, so <laughs> maybe I should not be led into that. Uh, see, but women in particular are vulnerable uh, in conflict, and gender discrimination and deep inequalities are at the heart of this issue. And it is only through consistent work to achieve progress at all levels that we can hope to mitigate women's particular vulnerabilities. vulnerabilities. The fight against impunity for sexual violence and gender-based violence in peacetime as in conflict is, is crucial. 2015 will be will mark the 15th anniversary of Resolution 1325. Um, establishing the agenda of women, peace and security. But ensuring results on the ground is still an outstanding challenge in, in many ways. And uh, we must bring also gender aspects and priorities to the heart of peace building and peacekeeping. Uh, and I think that is also part of the reviews that is going on in the UN um, in, in the UN, um, so we have to make sure that we, we bring knowledge and ex experience also into that uh, process. Uh, the third pillar, which uh, Sweden has consistently championed for a long time, concerns sexual and re reproductive health and reproductive health and rights. And this is an area of work uh, uh, that represents perhaps the greatest normative challenges. While maternal health and to a certain degree also uh, reproductive health have become accepted benchmarks, sexual and reproductive rights remain highly controversial uh, in many parts of the world, uh, including the, the EU. Um, important progress and central elements of the EU acquis has regretfully been undermined. So we have work to do in our own backyard as well as on the global level. The fourth pillar concerns another crucial building block in a feminist foreign policy, the economic empowerment of women for overall development and growth. Because we must combat discrimination in the labor market, but also promote women's legal rights with regard to inheritance, land acquisition and possession, as well as equal access to various social services. Finally, we will also integrate feminist perspectives in our work to promote uh, sustainable development and tackle climate change 
and other related threats. So the post-2015 development agenda will offer important opportunities to mobilize the feminist agenda and promote gender-sensitive approaches in all of these areas. Of course, I see, when I see Catherine, she reminds me that all of this is not, this must be a, a human rights agenda. It's not only for women, this is a, a human rights agenda. Um, and uh, a peace and security agenda um, priority. Um, and success will ultimately um, depend on our ability to mobilize, inspire ownership and develop adequate working methods. And this in turn will require investing in capacity building and raising competence levels. And I have therefore initiated an overhaul of my foreign service uh, in order, it sounds still strange to say that, my foreign service, <laughs> our foreign service, in order to ensure the, that the necessary competencies are developed and integrated into all sectors of the ministry's work. For most of our staff around the world, this is no, no, nothing strange. They every day meet all of these challenges on the ground. The reality check shows that there is still so much of discrimination and violence against women, um, that uh, women are not present at the decision-making tables anywhere or given power and a voice. So of course, if we want peace and development and security, we have to involve half of this world's population. But we also have to um, work in, in making sure that women are, and men in, in our services are well equipped to, to deal with it on a, on a daily basis, um, administratively and in every way politically. I've also appointed an ambassador at large for women's issues and uh, gender equality to be responsible for coordinating Sweden's uh, feminist foreign policy. And we have taken steps to involve civil society at an early stage of this process. So my last words will be about women's rights defenders, because they are true heroes of our time. Fighting relentlessly for women's rights, often in very difficult circumstances and at their own peril, they prove that women are at the forefront of the struggle for equality and change. And their struggle very often and in many places come at an unacceptably high price. Many of these women are confronted on a daily basis by an incomprehensible level of hate, threats and violence. Uh, and in a recent survey conducted by the Swedish NGO Kvinna till Kvinna, more than 60% of women interviewed had experienced public abuse, violence or received online threats. Um, so by calling for increased influence and measures aimed at improving the lives of women, women's rights defenders are in fact challenging existing power structures and the distribution of power. And violence is a way of trying to silence these efforts for change and development. Therefore, supporting and defending the women who are fighting for women's rights is crucial to the overall struggle for human rights, peace, democracy, and the rule of law and I count on your support for that and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Minister Wallström, and thank you for your leadership uh, and uh, our congratulations on your path forward. I'd like to invite our distinguished panelists forward and I will take a moment just to introduce each of them. Ambassador Catherine Russell currently serves as the U.S. Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues. Prior to assuming this position in August 2013, she served as Deputy Assistant to the President and Chief of Staff to Second Lady Dr. Jill Biden, focusing on military families and higher education. In her tenure at the White House, she coordinated the development of the administration's strategy to prevent and to respond to gender-based violence globally. 
to her left, Ambassador Dawn Steinberg is president and CEO of World Learning, an international nonprofit organization that provides education, exchange, and development programs in more than 60 countries. Many of you probably remember Ambassador Steinberg as he served as Deputy Administrator at the U.S. Agency for International Development. In his previous work with the U.S. government, Ambassador Steinberg served as the Director of the U.S. Department of State's Joint Policy Council, the White House Deputy Press Secretary, the National Security Advisor, Senior Director for Africa Affairs, and the U.S. Ambassador to Angola. And to my immediate left, Ambassador Johnny Carson. Ambassador Carson currently serves as USIP Senior Advisor to the President here. He served as Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Africa for four years, from 2009 to 2013. And prior to this, Ambassador Carson's 37-year Foreign Service career included ambassadorships to Kenya, Zimbabwe, and Uganda and Principal Duty, Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of African Affairs. Their full bios are on behind the agenda, and I will now turn the rest of the event over to Ambassador Carson. Thank you for your moderation. We look forward to seeing you all for the reception just following this event. And again, thank you all for coming. Mr. Wallstrom, it is a great pleasure to be on this podium with you uh, after uh, such a magnificent uh, speech about the importance of uh, gender equity and fairness uh, and about the new Swedish uh, feminist foreign policy. Uh, during the uh, next uh, 45 minutes to uh, an hour, I hope that we will have an opportunity uh, amongst ourselves to talk about uh, not only what Sweden uh, is leading uh, the global community in doing, but what others are also doing. Uh, this will be interactive, and I will start by asking uh, our panelists uh, a series of questions, and then I will open up the uh, questions uh, to the audience. Uh, at which time uh, there will be microphones on the sides, and I will ask those who are in the audience uh, who are asking questions to make their questions and commentaries brief, uh, and also to identify themselves uh, as uh, they speak. Uh, my first question will be to uh, Ambassador Catherine Russell, who is the State Department's ambassador at large for global women's uh, issues. Uh, how is the United States government helping to promote women's political and economic participation and uh, gender uh, e equality uh, in its foreign policy? Well, thank you so much, Ambassador Carson, for that question, and thank you for having me here. And really, Foreign Minister Wallstrom, it's such an honor to be here with you today. You're such an amazing leader on this issue and on all issues related to women, so I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here with you. We were together earlier at lunch, and um, I was so happy when you said that you're going to have an ambassador for women's issues in your government, because it'll now make three of us. So it's a small club. <laughs> so any other countries, I would strongly encourage you to consider doing that. Um, but I do think that uh, leadership is critically important and really does make a difference. So the fact that you are doing this and talking about this, once everyone gets past the sort of chuckling, I think it really will have a huge impact. And I think added to the work you did as special representative on sexual violence, the first one, that was an amazing task that you took on and really made a huge difference. So thank you, and I'm really delighted to be here with you today. Um, I would say this, Ambassador Carson, we have a few um, challenges that we're facing. One is... Um, I think on the political participation front, uh, there has been a great deal of work done in this area. Um, I, I would say that the progress would, I would characterize it as slow. Um, you know, we, I think in the, now the sort of roughly the number of um, women 
who serve as parliamentarians is about 21.9%. Um, and that was, it's up to 10% in the last 20 years. So at that rate, we have just a tremendous amount of work to do ahead of us. And I think we, as the United States government and we in the international community, have spent a lot of time working on that issue of trying to help more women get elected into office precisely because leadership is so important. Um, but I don't think we've broken the back of that problem yet. I don't think we know really how best to do it. Um, even in, in the United States, we're only at 20%, roughly, uh, political participation, sort of leadership in the Congress. Uh, you know, there are many people looking at that, trying to understand why that is, but I think it's really a big challenge for us and something that we need to do better. Um, if you look at the percentage of ministers, I think that's 17 percent, um, and you are a rarity. I, I was with Julie Bishop two weeks ago, so there, you're not alone, certainly, but many ministers, when I travel, the ministers who are women are ministers of health, sometimes education, really social issues for the most part, rarely. Not, not never, but rarely in finance and those places where they um, are driving policy beyond sort of women and children. And I think that's a real challenge for us as well. And I think, again, it's something that we somehow need to try to do better. On the peace negotiations and sort of peace process side, um, again, women are woefully underrepresented in those discussions in those areas. And that, I see that as a little bit of a different problem because it's not relying on electoral uh, politics. If these people are appointed, um, typically, and so I think that's a place where we definitely, um, you know, need to continue to bring diplomatic pressure, as we've been trying to do in the case of Syria, um, in South Sudan, but to try to make sure that women are represented, because I think it's it's clear. Although again, we we need more information, more data to support this, but that women. Um, just having a broad range of perspectives represented is useful, and having women there who can talk about sort of the immediate consequences of violence in their communities, because too often women now are, are victimized in these combat situations. But also sort of you know, thinking about education, thinking about um, social welfare. It's not that men don't think about that, but women in higher numbers tend to do that. And I think it is important, and again, something we really need to focus on. Um, third, and I'll just be really quick on these points. I think when I look at my job, and somebody else pointed this out at lunch as well, when I talk to people about you know, thinking about women, how to, how to include them, thinking about girls, it always um, comes back to a discussion of thinking about how it's in their self-interest to do it. Because I think most people, most governments, most entities operate in their own self-interest for the most part. And trying to make the argument to them about why it matters to have women in a discussion, why it matters to have women in the economic sphere, I think that's a challenge for all of us. And, we have more data on the economic side to show that it helps increase countries' GDP when women are participating, but we, we need more information on the political side. Um, and then I would say, in terms of what the United States is doing, our, our approach, and I, I think this is the right approach, is to try to look at these issues comprehensively. And too often we're doing you know, sanitation here and electoral politics here and economic empowerment here. And I think what we're losing is the notion that you have to address a community and the challenges that the women face in that community in a comprehensive way. It's incredibly difficult to do that, um, just because that's not really the way the United States government is set up, and that's not really the way other governments are set up either. But I think if we can try to coordinate with our partners, you know, with Sweden, for example, with the UK, with like-minded governments who are trying to do the same thing, I'm hoping we might find a way to make some progress on issues like girls' education on health, and women's economic empowerment and try to address them in a comprehensive way. Ambassador Russell, that was wonderful. I'm going to come back to you uh, a little later and ask what are some of the best practices that the U.S. government has uh, employed uh, in advancing uh, the uh, gender uh, equity uh, agenda uh, uh, on behalf of the U.S. government. Uh, but I'm going to now uh, turn to Ambassador Steinberg uh, and, and ask him a question. Ambassador Steinberg, you've written often and very convincingly about the need for military leaders and senior leaders uh, uh, in uh, the security establishments mm -hmm. to take gender considerations into account when security decisions, national security decisions are, are being made. How do men factor uh, into uh, this uh, agenda? 
Good question, Johnny. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I too wanted to say my thank yous to uh, the minister for her great work in the past and ask her if she would let me borrow her public affairs person because I want the branding message of a feminist foreign policy. <laughs> I want to, uh, if we had only had that at USAID, a uh, feminist uh, development policy, I think we would have achieved a lot more than we have. Um, I, I guess I want to pick up on what Kathy was saying about what the motivation for involving men in this process is. And I'll just tell one quick story. I was the, uh, on the Civil so Society Advisory Group to Ban Ki-moon uh, for Women, Peace, and Security. And I was asked frequently to talk to the police commissioners and the uh, military commanders and the negotiators for UN peace negotiations around the world and try to genderize them. And they figured that a 60-year-old white bald guy would be, <laughs> you know, uh, not pleading special interests for himself. <laughs> And so I would, I would go in, and I've done this a number of times, and the approach that works is an actual uh, eye-opener. You walk in and you, you talk about rights. You talk about women have rights under international conventions, local laws, etc. And the police commissioners and military commanders and uh, UN negotiators' eyes glaze over. You cannot get through on that point. Then you say, you know, it's women who suffer most in these environments. So when social order breaks down, it's women and children who are most vulnerable. They deserve it. It's fair. It's right. Eyes glaze over. <laughs> You then try, hey, this could be your mom, this could be your sister, you know, you look at what happens to women in Eastern Congo, look at girls trying to go back to school in Afghanistan and getting acid thrown in their face. And every now and again you'll get a glimmer. What only works is when you say, your peace process is going to mark your career and you will always be connected with that peace process is going to fail unless you involve women as planners, as implementers, as beneficiaries, unless you use their wisdom, their ground truth, unless you draw on 100% of the contributions of society, not just 50%, unless you incorporate issues of girls' education and psychosocial support for women, and accountability for abuses that took place during the conflict, you're going to alienate an entire part of the population, and you're going to need that part of the population at some point. Your process is going to fall apart. You're going to be permanently identified as having failed in a peace mission, and you're sure not going to get another job. And then they perk up. So, yeah. so is that the same as it will cost you? It will cost you. <laughs> it, it, it takes advantage of the fact that I actually believe that uh, women are from Venus and men are from Mars. And men care about, you know, personal career. Now, after a certain while, when you start watching the process work, then you accept the norms. You accept the fact that, you know, it, governments that have a minimum participation of women are in fact more humane. They do spend more money on you know, social issues and human development. They are less corrupt. They're far more effective. You find that uh, they accept the notion that girls' education is the single best investment you can make in restoring society and, and uh, building up health conditions. After a while, you, you can get them on the other issues you can go back to the rights argument, you can go back to the fairness, but it really is a question as long as we have not cracked this uh, problem that men appoint men to be peace negotiators and military commanders and police commissioners, until we do that, it is essential to do that genderization of the men who are involved. Thank you, Foreign Minister. Wallstrom, uh, in your current capacity and in your former capacity, uh, looking at this issue from the UN, are there some uh, 
cases uh, out there that represent uh, best practices? Are there uh, individuals or countries that are trying to do it right? Uh, are there uh, places uh, that are trying to uh, lead the way? Yes, there are many such people, many individuals, mm -hmm. definitely many NGOs, civil society organizations, many fantastic peacekeepers that, that try to do their best mm -hmm. also to interpret protection of civilians as also meaning women, asking where do women go, what kind of protection do they need. Uh, there are so many people out there trying to, and also government mm -hmm. representatives uh, actually, but um, the, um, for example, the fight against impunity for mm. these types of, of crimes uh, is still um, uh, a lot more to, to wish for. And uh, I think that we ha have been trying to put in place at least structures, people, gender advisors, um, protection uh, in, in many different ways uh, on the ground. Uh, but uh, there is m much more to do. I, I think there are good examples. Even in the DRC, you mm -hmm. can see that there have been trials, military trials, where mm -hmm. for the first time also commanders, uh, AFRDC mm -hmm. commanders, have been, uh, um, have been put on trial for these types of crimes. And, and that is, of course, progress, but there is so much of a historic... Uh, uh, um, sort of um, luggage mm -hmm. to, to deal with. So. Um, we've, it's going too slow. Um, but I think we have to recognize also some progress. The ICC, all the cases currently also on the, the ICC, uh, um, contains these elements of, uh, um, of uh, prosecuting also sexual violence, crimes for, of sexual violence. Um, but um, the problem is, is also, as somebody said, you know, to, to what you said in the sad list of, mm -hmm. of things that happened, that uh, in the end also peace negotiations will be done by bad men forgiving other bad men <laughs> in fancy hotels, as mm -hmm. somebody wrote on, mm -hmm. on uh, the internet. So uh, I think uh, there is so much uh, of, of these structures that have to be, be, be changed, but I think we should also notice progress and that, that there are so many fighting mm -hmm. for, for this. And I think maybe less and less controversial, actually. The, the giggling has, yes. has stopped. Mm -hmm. And we have here, I mean, um, many experts that, that work on this, also men. And I think maybe m modern men would really don't like to be depicted in, in that way that they they glaze over for anything else but the <laughs> arguments about losing power or that they, it will cost them. So I, I think uh, <laughs> we have, uh, we also have to note uh, the progress made. Absolutely. Ambassador Russell, your office at the State Department has now been in existence uh, for approximately five, five and a half years and you're the second uh, ambassador at large uh, to serve in that office. Are there examples uh, that uh, you and your colleagues have seen that uh, represent uh, progress and, and where are some of the uh, engagements uh, by the United States government in promoting gender uh, equity? I would, I would point to a couple of, of um, sort of concepts that we think are working pretty well. One is Assistant Secretary Ann Richard is here, who I don't know. How many of you know her? But she works at the State Department and does all the humanitarian issues. And one of the things that we've learned over time and through really bad example is that women are particularly vulnerable in times of conflict and humanitarian disaster. So Anne came up with a really wonderful program called Safe from the Start, where the United States, along with our partners, goes in and tries to, from the beginning, look out for problems that can confront women. So whether it's the way the camp is set up, or how they get access to water, or how they get access to food, or firewood, or whatever, we're trying to learn from our experiences and do better. And I think Anne's program is a great example of that. Um, I think the Foreign Minister mentioned accountability, and one of the other ideas that we've seen working pretty well, and we're all very focused on, on some of these really egregious cases, particularly um, what we saw in the DRC, where you know rape is just a horrible um, tool of war, and we're trying to figure out how to address that, because really these crimes are committed with almost complete impunity. People will never believe they're going to be prosecuted. 
One of the things that's turned out to be effective at this point, I mean, again, it's all early, but something called mobile courts where um, mm -hmm. people go in and, and get, the courts actually go to the community. So people aren't traveling long distances to try to prosecute their cases. And most importantly, people see justice served in their communities, which is critically important because for so many of those women, they just th never thought anybody would pay the, the price for what they're doing. Um, more generally, I think, and Ambassador Steinberg pointed to this too, we know that there are some things that work. We know that empowering women uh, economically makes a difference, that women invest in higher rates back in their families, so they're a good investment. So the United States now is supporting women's economic centers in different parts of the country, different parts of the world, the first to open in Pakistan um, in the middle of next month. And the concept really is to try to support women as entrepreneurs and give them the ability then to support their families, contribute to their communities. And finally, and Ambassador Steinberg pointed this out as well, but we are absolutely committed to girls' education, to trying to keep girls in school for as long as possible. We know if we delay marriage, um, if we keep them there, we'll delay marriage, as, as the Foreign Minister pointed out. It's, the child marriage numbers are horrific in some of these countries, and not just the numbers, but also the ages at which we're seeing these girls getting married, and the consequences Absolutely. to them in terms of their abilities to sort of procreate successfully and have any control over that, there are greater susceptibility to, to gender-based violence, there are greater incidence of HIV AIDS, I mean, absolutely horrific. And so we know that if we can keep them in school longer, we can help address some of those problems and hopefully move them into the workforce so then they can contribute to their families and communities. So we have an idea of what we think works pretty well. Now it's a question of you know, finding the resources, which is something that Don used to always have to do and now, um, and, and most importantly, trying to work with other partners because I think in this world of you know, diminished resources, we're all trying to work in a more co cooperative way mm -hmm. and say, you know, if we're doing this, you guys can do that. And I think where we're really looking at that carefully is in a place like Afghanistan, where we have seen a lot of progress for women, but we're all very concerned about trying to solidify that and make sure that it goes. To, to be fair, really, yeah. I think this is only the beginning of a long list of things that where you have contributed. And without the U.S., uh, we would never have, have had uh, Resolution 1960 passed, which uh, adopted, which ac actually meant that we will now be able to use, to draw on, on all, including sanctions, on, on mm -hmm. all the policy tools that the Security Council has right. uh, available. And I think this is extremely important in, in fighting impunity that we will now be able to pursue the, the perpetrators in a much more effective way. So but, just to give you credit but, for everything else also that has been That's done. an important point because I'm a, a huge fan of 1325, but we also have to remember that 1325 occurred in a different era yes. before the Security Council essentially had punitive measures that they would adopt in these spaces before they had sanctions, before there was a special advisor for these areas. It was a resolution adopted in an earlier period for an earlier Security Council. And the, the progress in terms of setting up your office in 1820 and 1887 and 1888, I think was a real change, a turning point. And, uh, I, I credit, frankly, the Nordic countries to a great extent for uh, pushing that agenda. How do we institutionalize uh, this uh, in uh, various governments around the world and in international organizations and in the NGO community? Uh, how do we move from uh, where we are uh, uh, at the forefront of this uh, to get uh, organizations uh, to buy into it fully, uh, not just simply to acknowledge uh, the importance uh, of, uh, of the role of, of gender and, and, and women in society, but to actually change uh, the minds uh, and the habits and the attitudes mm -hmm. uh, inside of organizations so that the issue of gender and women's uh, equity and empowerment uh, is real in everyday life in everybody's thinking whether it is in a security decision or whether it's with respect to financial decisions of a nation or health or education. No, it's a great how do we, question. How do we it's, it's a great question it? because I do believe we've made a lot of progress in a number of different areas. 
especially you know norms and just basic understanding i don't think very few people would disagree with much of what the minister said today about the importance of involving women the need to have every security council resolution talk about protection of civilians and protection of women uh, there, there are certain norms that have indeed changed i also think we have laws and policy documents and un resolutions that are very good and frankly they are now emerging throughout our systems we also have leadership in this space and if it's ellen johnson Sirleaf, if it's Krauss and michelle lemay guboe hillary clinton margot wallstrom i think we have the leadership now but what we don't have yet and what we were desperately trying to do at aid and they are continuing to do it now is to institutionalize these principles and the way that we decided we were going to do that at aid was to focus on four pillars first you have to do programs to assist women's empowerment and gender equality directly so you have to train women to be peace negotiators and we had a 15 million dollar program that did that you have to involve women's organizations in building uh, in other areas you have to support civil society institutions for women etc those programs directly we had a rule at USAID that you did not come forward with a project unless it had a gender impact statement it is a rule and you will be amazed to see some of the first projects that were put forward there was a bridge that was put forward in a country and the gender impact statement read 50 percent of the people using that bridge are women <laughs> I swear to you, that's true. Uh, and we went back and said, uh, try again. So, so, so that's important. Secondly, you have to mainstream and integrate it. I am delighted that we have Kathy Russell in her position, but one of the key roles is not only having a focal point, but making sure that the assistant secretary for prm and the assistant secretary for pm and the deputy secretary and everyone else takes gender seriously and incorporates it into their visions third we have to be thought leaders we have to push the envelope and we have to do the research that the minister was talking about because we haven't really we have a lot of anecdotal evidence for example that shows that the exclusion of women from peace processes leads to uh, the failure but it is not necessarily convincing there is more data that we need to accumulate in that space and finally we have to walk the walk in-house it is all great for the united nations to talk about gender equality and the importance of women in peace processes but to this day there still hasn't been a peace negotiator who has led a peace process that the UN has been involved with that was a woman. To this day, we're, to, we're talking about eliminating glass ceilings in all of our institutions. We're talking about looking at our rules of hiring, of firing, of promotion. We have to, we have to walk the walk in-house. And this is one thing I give the State Department great credit for that in the past 10 to 15 years they have indeed walked the walk such that we now have women in very senior positions uh, throughout the department and men who are sensitized to these issues in those positions as well so it really isn't a question of just changing norms changing laws or developing leadership it's also a question of institutionalizing that change and that's and that's very important thank you Don let's open this up a little bit to the to the to the audience out there I am sure that there are lots of questions uh, for the foreign minister uh, and our other panelists so uh, if you have a question uh, move to the right or left there are microphones on both sides uh, I would urge you again to do two things uh, make your question or comment uh, brief and also uh, identify yourself uh, and your affiliation we'll take uh, we'll take uh, three questions at a, at a time 
Jill Gay, What Works Association. A question from Minister Wallstrom. How do you plan for your government to promote sexual health and reproductive rights uh, at the UN within the UN's Sustainable Development Goals? And for my government, for Ambassador Russell, how do you plan to infuse our government foreign policy with a feminist agenda? Okay. Second question. My name is Chantal Junge Arthard. I'm with uh, WISE as well as USIP. Uh, and uh, first of all, I want to say to Ambassador Steinberg, uh, we need more research. I couldn't agree more with you. Um, but I have a question for Foreign Minister Wallström. In this town, and USIP is a little bit of an outlier here, but in this town, uh, when you talk about gender perspectives and foreign policy, uh, they're still laughing at you. Um, and uh, this town currently is uh, very preoccupied uh, with terrorism and violent extremism. Uh, both in the US as well as in Europe, this is really has gone again to the top of the policy agenda. And I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit for us what a feminist foreign policy would look like uh, when we're dealing with the issue of violent extremism and terrorism. We've got a third question up here. Hi, my name is uh, Federica Bindi. I'm at size here. Um, I have two quick questions for Minister Wallström. The first one, it's uh, now that you are heading the national policy of Sweden, which is one of the most pro-gender government, uh, what do you plan to do, if any, to push the gender issue within the European Union? Because my feeling is that it was an issue, it's going away. You know, I was looking at Erasmus+, Plus, it's not mentioned anymore as one of the key issues for research, going back to the research issue, and the directive on uh, women on board, on the, uh, on the corporate boards was put on the side. I mean, what can you do in your new capacity to push the issue at the European Union level? And then the second thing, uh, uh, going back to the previous um, comment, this is by all means a misogynous city. And it would be interesting, given your experiences as, as Swedish, if you could talk a little bit about pro positive discrimination. It will never happen here, but it would have help the, the, the debate. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Three very good questions. Madam Minister. Okay, maybe I start um, there. Um, of course, um, we have to be very active um, within the European Union in every uh, setting of uh, council setting and uh, I try to make sure that somebody ask, uh, the, asks the questions also at, uh, at the Foreign Affairs Council, uh, what about the women? And now they have started to look at me at the end of the debate, so if, if it was not mentioned, they are sure that I will uh, comment on, on that. And, and let me just, to, seriously, let me take Ukraine as an example, because we are in a very, um, very bad situation right now and dangerous situation. Uh, increased um, fighting and increased uh, killing of civilians and and um, a dangerous situation in, in every way. So how can uh, feminist foreign policy be applied? And we discussed it during the lunch uh, seminar today. Um, I hear very little of, um, of women and the situation of women, uh, for example, among the IDPs. Uh, and I just told the, the story about my visit to Kiev and I, I went to one of these shelters and met with uh, women and they were uh, from my point of view, or uh, what I could see, they were so traumatized they could not even tell what they had been through. And um, that could, of course, have been war crimes. You need a person that can help and assist in, in ma making the interviews, to follow up, to report on the situation of women and children. And, uh, of course, also our humanitarian assistance. And uh, I will uh, uh, tomorrow announce more of humanitarian assistance to, to Ukraine. That will also have to be designed in such a way um, that it helps uh, women and has a gender perspective. Uh, I think that the OECD can definitely also um, make sure that there are women police or women, mm -hmm. um, <coughs> um, women uh, in the OECD um, staff that can um, maybe look at things in, in a different way and with gender, gender lens uh, uh, on. Uh, we have to make sure that the resources that are directed to 
uh, to Ukraine also are, are used in order to, to help women and to see that they have a role in this uh, peace process. But it is a constant, it is a constant mm -hmm. struggle. As much of structures you, you set up, you need sort of the leadership, you need uh, people to ask the right questions, you need the expertise there. We can maybe second people also to help Ukraine. In, in making sure that they, they follow up. They become very often in conflicts and in post-conflict invisible. There are Absolutely. no women. There are men who represent the military, men who represent the, partner, the parties to a conflict, men who negotiate peace, men who, who take decisions and so on. And look at Greece. I mean, they announced an inner cabinet of 11 members, all men. <laughs> So you, you want to send a telegram, ever heard of women? <laughs> no, I, uh, no, no, I shouldn't um, be, uh, it's, it's difficult enough in Greece, but you know, it will, be, it will not be easier if they exclude women in, in the government or in the work of, of uh, restoring also the economy. So I think it has to be a consistent, and I think the best is to, to show the examples, to work on the concrete cases that we have in front of, uh, of us. So in the EU, we, we have to all the time ask the questions. We have to check on the programs. We have to make sure that this is a factor uh, in uh, and an element in, in the programs and in the decisions that we, that we take. Um, not easy. I also hope that the theme of, of uh, women, peace and security will be carried out by Federica Mogherini uh, herself and maybe again she can be helped by uh, an envoy or somebody, a focal point within the EU that can, can also drive these, uh, these issues and, ha and help to do so. On counter-terrorism, that's another example. We mm -hmm. have uh, appointed a national coordinator to, uh, to work on ex uh, violent extremism. And uh, she has engaged with, um, uh, with, of course, many of the religious leaders. She is engaging with schools and, uh, and making sure that um, uh, our approach to, to, to this whole issue is, is one of dialogue. Uh, uh, one of uh, making sure that we have, that we continue to promote diversity and mm -hmm. uh, tolerance. Uh, but she has also mentioned that so many women, mothers in particular, worried about uh, um, if their sons or daughters were going to, uh, considering f fighting for ISIL and leaving, where would they turn? So she wants to open a, a phone line where you can um, mm -hmm. where you can dial to, to get some advice on, on, uh, on what to do and, and help. And this is again with that particular perspective, I think, and listening to the women and, and their concerns uh, about this. So I think it's in the, the, the big and the small uh, issues, we, mm -hmm. we just have to have somebody asking uh, the right questions. I think you have, I often quote you saying that nothing about them without them. Mm -hmm. And that is the sort of basic uh, mm -hmm. rule, of course, that we, uh, we have to make sure that women are well represented also when discussing counter-terrorism. Is there a, 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 a perspective, a gender perspective on all of this? Look at who are the targets uh, of also ISIL's um, horrendous uh, violent uh, acts, uh, women and girls. And uh, there is no stopping them and no, uh, no uh, what it seems, borders uh, at all for, for what, uh, what they can do to, to women and girls. So I think they are also the victims, mm -hmm. but, but as much women are also uh, actors and, and want to play a, a part. Um, and I, I take uh, comfort from, and I, of, I often quote you, Laura Liswood, because you're the one who said that um, it's not actually a glass ceiling, it's a thick layer of men. <laughs> so um, so that, that, that helps. Uh, uh, and um, I, I don't know how to answer really what we do with health and reproductive uh, issues when it comes to the, the post uh, uh, the devel new development agenda. There are a few issues that will continue to be very, very difficult. Um, democracy is another uh, aspect where I, I'm not entirely pleased with uh, the outcome of, uh, uh, of the consultations and the work on, on the new development agenda. I think um, it is very much to, uh, to those countries that understand how important this, this is to continue to advocate for it. 
The strength of the new agenda is, of course, that it is for every country, not only the developing countries, not only the, the poorest countries in, in this world to, to do their homework, but it is for every country to ensure that, this is, uh, that this, these uh, issues are, are dealt with. And I think the EU will have to have a, a, a proper debate also on, on these things, not to turn turn back uh, and take steps backward on, on these issues. But uh, there is no simple solution, and I will have to work on that uh, properly also uh, for, for, from our, our side. Ambassador Russell, did you want to make any, any comments? I think she there? asked me on the, on the um, feminist foreign yeah. policy. I, I would say this. I think um, a couple quick points. One is that leadership obviously is incredibly important and right now we're lucky to have a president and a secretary of state who believe in this and care about it and have empowered me and the rest of the department um, to make sure that women and girls are addressed in the, in the course of our foreign policy. Having said that, it's still not easy to do it and there are times when people need to be reminded. Um, but by and large, people accept the argument. We're not making the argument anymore. We're just reminding people that they've got to do this. And again, to my earlier point, it's in their interest to do it. They will be more successful. Their peace negotiations will be more successful. Their economic efforts will be more successful if, if women and girls are included from the beginning rather than as an afterthought. Um, but one of the things that we're trying to do is really make sure that all of that is institutionalized so that it really doesn't depend on the leadership, so that whomever is there as secretary or whomever is here as president or in my job, that this is so ingrained in what the State Department does that it's not really an issue anymore. Um, you know, that it's a sort of a Herculean task, but we're, we go about that every day and try to make it clear to our colleagues why it matters. Secretary is very proud of the fact that most of his assistant secretaries are women. Um, he believes very strongly that we're doing the right thing, and he tries to, you know, support us in the effort. But I can't, I can't say that it's an easy thing to do. Do we have Johnny, any, Johnny? Uh, can I? Sure, absolutely. Just weigh in. Uh, you know, we all bemoan the fact that this city doesn't focus on these issues in the big policy deliberations. But I would point the finger back at ourselves. We who are advocates in this area have not done a good enough job at connecting the dots. Uh, we argue that women are important in these peace processes, etc. But to me, the real arguments are that societies that protect women, that involve women in these processes, that focus on girls' education are more stable. They're more democratic, they're more prosperous. And that means they are more supportive of a national security agenda. These are countries that do not traffic in drugs and people and weapons. They don't send refugees across borders or across oceans. They don't harbor terrorists or pirates. They don't transmit pandemic diseases. And perhaps most importantly in this town, they don't require American military force or troops on the ground. And if we can connect the dots for people to say this isn't an agenda that, I'm sorry, is mostly about rights or fairness or equity, it is about American national security interests, then I think we can make much more progress. The other point that I wanted to make, and just talk briefly about my organization, we are currently involved in Pakistan to help build an education system that is open to girls, that is liberal, that is providing a quality education, and that can compete with the madrasas, so that parents decide to send their kids to the public school system instead of getting a madrasa education. We are net right now with IRC training 90,000 teachers throughout that entire country. And again, that's the kind of program that can directly attack terrorism and insecurity where it lies. And I, I will tell you that my board of directors was very reluctant to get us involved in Pakistan. It was the first time we moved there. I went out and bought 25 copies of the book, I Am Malala. And I sent each one a copy. And I said, if you read this book and tell me you don't think it's consistent with the world learning mission, to be helping to create a liberal, women-oriented uh, education system, tell me. No one told me. I'm not sure anybody read the book, but <laughs> no one told me. Do we? Okay. 
Good evening. My name is Elsa. Would you, would you stand up, please, and speak a little louder so that we can both see you and, uh, and, and hear you? Good evening. My name is Kelsey Campbell, and I'm a female veteran from the U.S. I served in Iraq and in Pakistan and uh, have dealt with many gender issues there. Um, and I've seen all across America that racism is no longer tolerated, homophobia is no longer tolerated, but sexism is still tolerated. Um, right now, as we're working to integrate women into all the job opportunities in the military, there's a lot of people who are very vocal and allowed to speak saying things that I just don't think women should have that ability to do that job in the military. So how do we truly show them that equality is a true American notion? Thanks. Thank you. We have a question on the right hand. Slide. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tatiana Hiranko and I am an LLM student at uh, the George Washington Law School. Um, Minister Wilson, it's nice to have you here and thank you for paying attention um, to Ukraine issue. And uh, I have a question. Could you specifically emphasize um, in which way you're going to provide your agenda according to Ukraine, especially streets against women, rapes, and uh, abuses? Uh, because uh, the territory of East Ukraine is occupied by the Russian terrorists. And it's difficult now to have uh, to get any evidence of these uh, crimes against humanity. And the second question um, is: Are you have any plans to, for negotiation with the um, Russian uh, government as well, who, uh, which is particularly um, is a sponsor of the terrorism in Ukraine, about any peaceful resolutions? against uh, to stop all the streets uh, for the civilians and the last one in Mariupol, 30 people killed and more than 100 injured and part, half of it a woman and children. Thank you. Thank you. Third question Hi, here. Uh, Anna Kostman from the World Bank. Also a question from Minister Vanstrom. You mentioned briefly that you would take into consideration climate change in your feminist foreign policy. And with a Paris Agreement coming later this year, I was wondering if you could give a little more detail on how you see to do that. Thank you. We'll stop there. Madam Minister. Thank you. Um, we have, uh, within the European Union, formed a group called Friends of Ukraine. And we, uh, we are trying to organize breakfast meetings uh, uh, and, and other gatherings to uh, also engage with the Ukraine and with uh, the ministers from the government from, of, of Ukraine to see how can we best help, how can we assist. And I think that this is now really a subject for discussion within that group. How can we, in this very difficult situation, uh, help also with this, uh, uh, with this perspective of looking at the needs uh, for, for protecting uh, uh, women and children in, in particular, and with um, a sort of a feminist approach to, to this issue. It has to be designed, um, you know, from out from their situation and from the reality on the ground. How can we best help? Can we second people, as I said? Can we insist in helping them to, to ratify, you know, make sure that the legal uh, framework is, is there? Um, how can we assist in doing that? How can we uh, also design the humanitarian uh, assistance in, in the right way? Um, not easy uh, at all, but I, I definitely have seen that there is a, a, an interest and that the new government also wants to, to engage with us. So I think we also have an opportunity right now to make sure that uh, that they get it right and that the reform work that they've started also can include this perspective. So I think we just have to work with them to make sure that we, we can assist in the best possible possible way and that there is an ownership uh, in Ukraine for whatever we, we decide to do. And then we have to work th uh, through the channels that already exist, the OSCE, the, uh, the, the European Union, uh, all of these different settings where, where we engage with, with Ukraine. Um, and suddenly it all went blank. Uh, <laughs> what was the last question? The and climate, climate change. change. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Um, I, of course, climate change also as a, a security threat 
is, is already recognized. I think mainly from here, actually, in Pentagon reports uh, uh, demonstrate that this is also a threat to, to security. Um, what we've seen is also that climate change, as it is already manifested and demonstrated to already today, also affects uh, very often women first. They are the, mm -hmm. the ones who, who take care of the harvest. They are the ones who see that the season this year is very strange. It came, you know, the rain came much later, that, that the, the things that affect their everyday lives. And I think this, again, has to be taken seriously. And um, I, I remember being, and this was many years ago, but being in, in Liberia and women uh, farmers just said exactly that. They told us the stories about how everything has, has become so strange because the seasons are, are, are changing mm -hmm. and the harvest and, and all of that is, is changing. They could not put words on it because women have not been informed about, uh, very often they lack the education or the information to, to understand that this is uh, uh, also so a, a, an effect of climate change. So I think it has to do with all these different elements also on, uh, on the issue of, of climate change and it's definitely something that we care a lot about and looking at security policy in a much broader way than, than previously. Absolutely. But we also have to deal with the situation in our neighborhood. So it, it combines sort of the very traditional way of, of having to look at defense policies with the fact that we now have pan pandemics, that we have uh, um, uh, terrorism, that we have climate change, that we have all of these other uh, security threats as, as well. And there has to be a, a gender perspective and ask, somebody has to ask those questions. I don't know whether uh, Ambassador Russell or Ambassador Steinberg want to uh, provide a response to the uh, question about uh, sexism in the uh, in the in the military, uh, and and then that will in fact be our last question. But go ahead. Yeah, uh, I, it's a it's a very valid question, but it's uh, if you look at how we addressed racism and how we addressed homophobia in the military, it was executive action. It was Harry S. Truman who desegregated the U.S. Army. It was Barack Obama who said, don't ask, don't tell is by definition discriminatory. We've got to get rid of it. To me, you're focusing on attitudes, but there are a number of places where laws and regulations and orders have to proceed changes in attitudes and unfortunately I think this is one of those cases I always remember you know Martin Luther King once said you know I can't make that white racist love me but I can sure make him stop lynching me and that's the principle that I think needs to apply in this case and frankly there are lessons from all around the world in this regard you know it's not too far of a stretch to say you know, in society after society around the world, we have quotas for women's participation in political life. And it may be that that would not be the natural result to have 30% women's participation in parliaments, but we know it is a social and a political and a national security good, and so we do it. And it is not reverse discrimination, and I just have to keep reminding people that more countries in the world have those quotas than don't. 106 countries have them. 86 don't, so it is not for those who are advocating those quotas to be explaining why they're doing it. It's for other societies. And, you know, Kathy was talking about the percentages of women in parliament. If you change the word parliament to Congress, it's even worse. <laughs> And so let's not, you know, put ourselves in this country up as a paragon of women's equality until we start addressing those issues as well. Best Russell. Um, well, first, I, I'd like to thank you very much for your service. And I, um, you know, I, when I travel around the world, it's really interesting because people think that I'm the minister for women in the United States. <laughs> so they always ask me questions about the United States. And what I say is that, um, you know, we in, the, in this country have made a lot of progress on women's issues and other issues, but particularly on women's issues. Um, you know, we've done some really great work. I used to work for the vice president and did some great work on the Violence Against Women Act. We, we have made real progress here. I think the political participation is, a, is definitely a challenge that we have not overcome. But otherwise, 
women have rights, women get to go to school, blah, blah. Women serve in the military, and in some places that's not the case. But we, there's no question that we have challenges that remain. And sometimes um, when I talk to other countries, they, they, they may not even get that. They think the United States, everything's perfect for women because they kind of get that story. And I'm like, you know, there is no country where women don't face violence, whether it's in the military or just in their communities. Not a single country, even the Nordic countries, which are spectacular on so many levels. Um, and certainly the United States, you know, we have a serious problem with that here. We have challenges that we need to overcome. And I think what I come back to is, you know, there are things that need to get done. You need to get the laws in place. And I think in the United States, we've pretty much done that. Um, you know, there are some challenges with, um, uh, things like um, exactly what you're describing, but also other sort of pervasive ideas that people have. And I think pop culture is part of that discussion, and we need to we need to address that. I never, you know, I don't go through life like, you know, yelling about women's rights and all the rest of it because I do enough of that at work, but I am very <laughs> mindful of it, mostly because I have two teenage kids. And I know that I have one boy and one girl, and boys are not born with any preconceived notions about women. You know, they, that is just, that is a learned thing. And in the United States, when you look at the images, when you see, you know, endless beauty pageants or, you know, these um, sort of places where women are really debased, whether it's in, you know, songs or videos or whatever it is, I think we need to be mindful of what that message is to our kids and we need to try to counteract it and we need to do it with our boys and with our girls. And at some point, I believe, because otherwise I would have to quit my job, that we will, we will prevail in this. But I think it's a long haul, honestly. And, um, you know, the military has its issues. I mean, certainly, um, but the military also provides opportunities for women. I think we have to try to find the best in an institution and then and try to correct the problems that we face there. Madam Minister. Don't you have a gun? <laughs> no, no, it, it really makes me so it makes me so sad to hear those things because I what I understand you are by now how many of the what's the percentage of women fifty so you already fifteen percent yes yes. 15, and you already now uh, make a fantastic uh, um, contribution and, and uh, a very often a very courageous and brave work. You also put yourself in harm's way uh, together with, with the others. You should not have to be a subject to, to abuse uh, uh, by language or, or uh, other ways, sexual violence and, and what have you. So this is so sad. I think when we, uh, when we uh, work with um, uh, sexual violence in, in conflict, we used to say that it can be commanded, condoned or condemned. And I think the same is here. It has to start from the very top. This, uh, you need commanders who, who say, this should never happen under my watch. This is totally unacceptable, and I will not accept any language of this kind or behavior uh, of that uh, sort. And then it has to, to be dealt with through the system, of course. But, but this is totally unacceptable and, and very sad to hear. You are not alone, unfortunately. Unfortunately, also on, on this issue, it happens uh, elsewhere, but uh, we just have to stop it in every possible way. I, Madam Minister, thank you very, very much. Uh, we have gone past uh, our time, uh, but I want to just take uh, one minute to uh, say how pleased we are at USIP to have an opportunity uh, to welcome you back uh, again. Uh, to talk about uh, Sweden's uh, feminist foreign policy. Uh, as one of the great uh, democracies of the world, uh, Sweden has frequently uh, been uh, a leader, uh, a thought leader, a change leader, uh, a visionary when it comes to setting uh, a uh, new direction in respect for uh, human rights, uh, civil liberties, uh, and good governance. Uh, this afternoon you've given uh, us uh, all here 
uh, a perspective of Sweden leading uh, again uh, in an important area uh, on ensuring the empowerment of women and ensuring uh, gender uh, equity. Uh, the United States, and I'm sure Ambassador Russell would uh, echo this, is, uh, is, uh, is also uh, a strong leader uh, in this area uh, as well. Uh, and I think uh, it is the work uh, of your country uh, and our government working uh, in collaboration and partnership that will help enormously uh, help to uh, empower uh, women and ensure gender uh, equity. Uh, we also know uh, that doing this uh, also requires changing uh, the mindset uh, and the norms of many men who constitute uh, not that glass ceiling but that thick layer uh, that's out there. Uh, and that is uh, very important uh, that we continue to uh, work uh, uh, and strive to ensure that when we talk uh, about uh, human rights and when we talk about uh, justice and equity, uh, it does not represent simply 50% uh, of the global community, but 100% of the global community. And this afternoon, uh, you've led uh, us in a very powerful discussion uh, on a very important issue. So we're extraordinarily uh, pleased and happy that you were able to join us uh, this afternoon, and we look forward to welcome, welcoming you back. We also uh, thank Ambassador Russell for being here uh, with us this afternoon uh, and for the enormously good work that she does at the Department of State on behalf uh, of not only the Department and the Secretary, but on behalf of the uh, administration and the U.S. government, uh, ensuring uh, that we continue to keep gender issues uh, at the forefront, uh, not only of our thinking, but of our foreign policy and our efforts. And again, Ambassador Steinberg, longtime colleague, glad to uh, have you here as well, uh, pushing uh, the institutionalization of these issues uh, and reminding us uh, that uh, men have to uh, be sensitized to play uh, a more open uh, role uh, in this process. Uh, it is not uh, just a 50% job, it's a 100% job. So again, uh, would you all join me in thanking Seated until the minister leaves.